All right, welcome everybody. I'm Kim Hallen, and I'm really excited to launch today's discussion, which is uh, called Through the Eyes of the Horse. And we are going to be talking about all things equine vision today. And I have some, some lovely women with me today, some horse professionals who are online live, who are gonna join in this conversation. And so before we get started, I actually wanna just give them each a moment to introduce themselves and let you know where they are and a little bit about them. So you'll know who else is uh, participating if you're watching this recording back later. So I'm just going to have call on them in the order that they registered. Actually, that's the easiest way to do it. So um, Anna, if you will introduce yourself, please. Okay, I'm Anna Fox and I'm from Virginia. Um, and normally I teach dressage riders and my goal is to really teach people more about their horses than about riding necessarily. Um, and my goal is to launch a virtual business of doing more of this and extending my reach since um, I have children and it's hard to travel and get out as much as I used to. And my shadow back here is actually Angela and her daughter, Gracelyn is one of my students and has been for several years. So they don't have good internet. So she's gonna shadow and take notes while Graceland's in school. <laughs> Perfect, that's so. great. So did you say where you're located, Anna? Um, I am in Virginia, uh, near Warrington, Virginia. Okay, and it can, is there one thing that either of you are really hoping to get out of today's discussion before we start? Mm. I'm just hoping to learn more about you, their vision. It's always kind of a mystery, so. Yeah. Oh, great. It really is something that's not discussed a lot in, in the horse industry. So thank you both for being here. All right. So now let us go to Sandy. Hi, I'm Sandy Corrigan. I live in Elizabeth, Colorado, south of Denver, about an hour. And um, always excited to hear anything Kim has to say. <laughs> I've learned so much from her. Um, I have a business about business. So my husband and I facilitate business owners in what we call three to five clubs. And it's a community of business owners that work on developing connection community with 24 months of content. And I have since specialized in creating a community of horsewomen, small business owners internationally. So my goal is to use my coaching background, my work with horses. I am certified in equine assisted learning and we have horses. And uh, so the combination of my passion around horses and people that have horse businesses and particularly women. And I am, <clears throat> I'm super excited to learn about equine vision. I feel like this year has been just everything opening up on spirit, soul, and body and learning about my horse and horses learning how to communicate with them, what they're trying to tell me. And so this is another chapter in the journey and I'm very excited to be here and meet all of you. Great, super, thank you, Sandy. All right, and then let's go to Karen. Good morning. I am Karen Keeler. I live in Erie, Colorado, which is about an hour north of Denver. Hi, and I am an end of life doula for animals, mostly horses. And I'm also an energy worker and therapeutic touch. And I think the reason I really wanted to, to, to um, take this course today was to understand how horses see the world, how they see us. What am I not understanding? Um, how can I, how can I expand my vision through their vision? Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you, Karen. And I'm really excited that you all have kind of different backgrounds and different connections to horses and the horse community. So one of my goals with doing something like this is, is that we can create a ripple effect. So the information that you take in today that's helpful for you, you can share with your communities and then hopefully we'll spread a broader knowledge about equine vision into the horse world. So wonderful. All right, so I'm going to now just go into some of the um, some of the discoveries I've made. I've just been researching equine vision because I became really fascinated about it. Um, and I can't even really say what triggered it. Uh, none of my horses are having a particular problem. It was, I looked something up and then that just got me started. That's kind of how it happens with me. 
and I realized that there's just really a lot that um, is misinformation out there or um, you know gets passed around as theory. I've heard a lot of things and so I just started wanting to answer a couple of my questions and then got deeper and deeper into really wanting to understand it. But so I'm going to start from kind of an, an evolutionary perspective because that's how I love looking at things and looking and understanding the horse is not just um, you know, how we interact with the horse in the domestic world, but what, what did the horse evolve to be? Because if we wanna understand its anatomy and physiology and even its behaviors, we need to understand you know, what it evolved to be, which isn't necessarily what we uh, always choose to do with horses. So the most important thing to start with is that all creatures uh, evolved to have perfect vision for their lifestyle. And that includes us as human beings. Our vision evolved over millions of years, billions of years to um, be perfect for our purposes, right? So that's true with the horse as well. And the horse's evolutionary superpower is visual superpower anyway, is its ability to de detect predators, particularly at a distance and in low light situations. So if you think about a horse in the wild, that's its most vulnerable time is at night when predators are out doing their hunting and horses need to be able to stay safe in that situation, All right? So again, predators at a distance, low light situations. You can already probably be thinking that's not exactly the situations that we're typically working with our horses uh, in the domestic world. So right away we see that, um, there might be some, some challenges between what they evolve to be and do uh, visually and how, how we interact with them. So I'm gonna start with uh, the size of the horse's eye. Some of you, I had always heard that horses have the largest eyes of any land mammal. And I was pleased to look that up and discover that that is, that is absolutely true. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why their eyes are so big. Uh, one of the reasons is kind of logical Generally speaking, larger animals with more body mass have larger eyes. That's one typical, um, it's a generality, it's not a, a rule because obviously elephants are bigger than horses, but yet horses have bigger eyes. So that's not the whole story. The scientists have actually found another factor that's even more dependable that determines uh, an animal's size, the size of their eyes, and that is how fast the animal can run, okay? So obviously horses are faster than elephants. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, and it seems to be some combination of those things, but this, the how fast the animal runs seems to be more consistently predictable with eye size, even than body mass. But it seems to be a combination of those, those two factors. Um, and why do animals that run fast need to have bigger eyes? Well, there isn't actually, I couldn't find any definitive proof about that, but the theory seems to be that an animal that is running very fast needs to have really good vision in order to not collide into things going at a fast speed or trip over things. Uh, and that does make sense. Um, but when you think about, so, you know, a lot of other animals are really fast, cheetahs and other things. Uh, why are the horses so much bigger? And it may not just be about body size, but when you think about horses, when they are running at their fastest speeds in the wild, it's typically as part of a herd in a stampede kind of situation. So if you think about that, they have to um, not only see where they're going and not run into things or trip over each other, but they're in, they're in a packed in together. There's a lot of legs, there's a lot of bodies. And then also they're having to keep their eyes on the predators. And there could be more than one predator. It could be a pack of wolves. So there's a lot of things that their eyes need to be um, very, dependably giving them information while they're running very fast. So the more I thought about that, some of that is my own speculation and just using logical reasoning. But I think that maybe um, those may be some of the reasons why horses have such large eyes. And the only downside of having large eyes is that that's a lot of, of mass of the horses. Uh, I think it's a cornea that is exposed to the air. So, you know, they are in danger of having their eyes dry out. And that's one of the reasons, one of the primary reasons that horses have that third eyelid. Uh, it's, it's a protection, but it's also, it helps keep the, um, the very large eye that's exposed to the air um, moist and hydrated. So that's a little bit about the size of the horse's eyes. Now, their eyes are big, but really how good is their vision? And, how good vision is, is called visual acuity. 
And this is where it gets a little bit uh, less um, sure, some of the data, but there seems to be, I found a lot of, site, of sites and reputable sites that all said horses have visual acuity between 2030 and 2060 vision. So we have 2020 vision. And what that means when a horse, if the horse had 2030 vision, what that means is that a horse could, what a horse can see, what we can see at 20 feet away from like the eye chart, the horse would need to be 30 feet away. I'm sorry. <laughs> what we can see at 30 feet away from the, the, the visual chart, the horse would have to be 20 feet away to see as well as we can see at 30 feet away, right? And if their vision is 2060, then we could see something at 60 feet away that they would have to be 20 feet away from to be able to see it as well as we do, all right? That's, that's the range. And I, and I don't know that um, from what I could gather from the research that I did, it's not so much that there's that really huge range of equine vision, but that depending on which part of the eye, and we're gonna talk more about this, which part of the eye the horse is using and which type of vision, monocular or binocular, the vision, uh, the acuity uh, varies. So there's some parts of the eye and the way they look at some things that they may have closer to 2030 vision, which is you know similar to ours. And then there's some other parts of the eye and ways that they use their eye where their vision may be more like 2060, which is significantly um, poorer than our acuity. So here's another thing. And this one, I'll just say up front, I only found one study that talked about this. I couldn't find any other information. So it seems like a pretty valid study, but I will let you know the, the things that I found multiple sources for and the things that I only found one for. But this one study suggested that 23% of horses are nearsighted and 43% of horses are farsighted. So it's more horses, if this is true, tend to be farsighted. And as we talk more about some of the things coming up, um, that will make more sense to you. As I said at the beginning, they're designed, their eyes are designed to be able to see things at a great distance. So being farsighted would, would benefit that. Um, this I also only found one site for, but it's very interesting. Uh, it said that the best visual acuity for the horse is at age seven. Up until age seven, their eyesight is still developing. It's not fully developed. And then after seven, right, right away after seven, it apparently, according to this study, starts to decline. Right, we all know that vision goes down as we age, but I thought that was pretty early in their life for them to peak and that it didn't stay at peak according to this study for um, too long. So that was really, really very interesting. Um, and I see some of you taking notes, feel free to take notes now, but you are gonna get this recording, a copy of this recording, those of you who are live, so um, you'll be able to watch it back. So the next really important thing is the position of the eyes in the skull of the horse. The way that it's evolved, the eyes are at the top of the skull near the ears, right? And um, the eyes are outward facing, which is very common in prey animals who have monocular vision. So the, the, being at the, top, the eyes being at the top of the skull makes a lot of sense when you think about that the horse evolved to be a grazing animal that grazes for up to 18 hours a day. Right, so its head is down and often in kind of longer grass or weeds or brush. And by having their eyes high on the, at the top of the skull near the ears, they can, they can scan the horizon without picking their head up, right? That's, that's what their eyes are designed for, designed to do. And that's why they are where they are positioned in the horse's skull. All right. Um, talk a little bit now about the range of sight and the blind spots, which has something to do with where the eyes are positioned in the skull. So most of us have heard that horses have almost 360 degree um, vision around them. And that is true. They have about 167 degrees of vision or visual field on both sides of their body. So it's about 334 degrees around. I found many, many, many uh, studies that had that specific number. So 334 degrees around the body, they can see at any time. Their blind spots are, um, one is directly in front of their face. So we know we talked about that their eyes are, are wide set, outward facing. We all know that big forehead that we love to you know, reach for and touch. Um, they are blind in that directly in front, 
anywhere where that spacing between the two eyes and the forehead blocks is a blind spot. What that means is there's kind of a triangle coming out from the eyes going forward um, so that once you get to where their eyes can meet up, we're gonna talk about this, they actually have very, very good vision in that area, but something that's closer in than that, like when we reach for them to pet them, our hand might be in their visual field and then it goes into the blind part of their visual field, which is why a lot of horses, when you reach for that part of their face, they actually will turn their head. And we tend to think they're saying, I don't, I don't want you to touch me or I don't like your energy or something. We take it as a, as a negative feedback and they may simply be saying, I can't see what your hand is doing. And especially if it's not someone they trust or they're not used to being handled in that way, that, that would be disconcerting. So we shouldn't take that as feedback necessarily on how they feel about us as much as it is, um, you know, we wouldn't really like a predator. <laughs> We're a predator, whether we like it or not. A predator's hand coming at our face and then disappearing where we don't see what it's gonna do. So that's a really important blind spot. Uh, another blind spot um, is directly, um, well, actually directly below the nose. So when a horse is grazing, it cannot see what is underneath its nose. So horses rely on um, whiskers is one of the things that horses evolved to have to compensate for their blind spots. And those whiskers, um, some of you may know, each whisker has like a receptor to a particular or neuron receptor to the brain. Lots of information comes through those whiskers. So when we clip a horse's whiskers, we are handicapping them a little bit because um, they're still gonna have that blind spot, but now they don't have the feelers that can help them identify things under their, under their mouth. They also use their lips um, for feeling as well. Um, so let's talk about, so we're talking about whiskers. Another, um, not a blind spot, but we're gonna talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this. There is evidence that as something gets very, that horses, maybe their best acuity is six to 10 feet away from their body. And that when things are very close to them, it's blurry, it's blurry the acuity is not clear um, for them. So that would be another reason why they would have those long whiskers around their eyes is a way to again, protect their eyes if they're not, you know, like we see something, we things, see things really well up close, but if they're, you know, got their face near a fence or something like that, that has a sharp, something sharp on it um, or an, an electric fence, those whiskers by the eye could help protect their eyes um, from something that they may not be able to see really clearly visually that it's sharp but they might you know, feel it before they would put their eye on it. So again, these whiskers are really important and they have uh, a purpose, many purposes, but one is to compensate for the areas where they don't have, they either have no vision or limited vision. So another blind spot is directly behind the head, obviously. Um, those of you, many, many people have heard about you know, when a rider sits on a horse's back, um, if the horse's head is forward, then a big portion of our body is in their blind spot. That's something that also we don't think about very often. They can probably see uh, our arms and different parts of us. And all it can take is like a little bit of a tilt to their head in order for them to get us in with at least some of their vision, although probably not the part of their vision where the acuity is really good, right? So they're seeing us back there, but maybe not real clearly. Again, that could be part of why certain things in that space um, can frighten them or make them nervous. Because one, they can't, part, partially they can't see it at all in the blind spot. And then when they can see, it may not be real clearly uh, what they can see. Um, this was something I hadn't really thought about, but it makes total sense. Uh, horses do not have, they have very, very poor quality vision above eye level and below eye level. So things over their head, um, they, they, that part of their vision is not very clear. Again, we're talking about acuity. They do have vision there, but it may not be very clear. And below them. Now, if you think about a horse in the wild spending most of its time grazing, there's not a whole lot of the world that's below eye level, right, for them at that point. But in the domestic world, and when we're riding them and doing things with them, their head, are, their head is typically up. So they're not seeing what's going on underneath them and probably not seeing very clearly anything that is below eye level, um, even around them. Again, we're back to, they see it, but it may, may not be very clear, um, might be blurry. Uh, let's see. Um, 
Yeah, so I think I've covered all of that. So I'm referring to my notes to make sure I get everything. Now here's another one. Color. Do horses see color and what colors do they see? Well, the answer is yes, they absolutely see color. They don't just see in black and white, but they have what's called dichromatic vision, um, which means they only have the cones in the eye or is the um, feature that sees color or that determines color. And if they have dichromatic vision, they only have two types of cones. So they see two of the, of the primary colors. Um, most people have trichromatic vision, which is we see all three uh, primary colors and we have three types of cones in our eyes. So horses have one less type of cone in their eyes. So they see what we would probably call washed out versions of colors. They definitely see colors, but they're not as vibrant as ours. And they can see yellow and blue uh, very well, which means they also see green because obviously yellow and blue make green. But it seems in studies that some horses have trouble distinguishing between certain shades of green and, and yellow and blue. Mostly green and yellow though. And most horses cannot see red. Although this is interesting, I guess we should say all horses don't see red because they don't have the cone for the color red. But some horses did seem to be able to distinguish some shades of red from gray. Gray is the other color that they, that they can see. So something about the shading of red looks different than gray, but not all horses were able to make that distinction. Again, that could simply go back to the ages of the horses. We talked about how the vision gets less um, as they get older or, or many other factors. We also should assume, I, I think we should assume that not all horses have the same vision. Not all humans have this, not all humans have 20-20 vision, even though humans generally can have 20-20 vision. And this is again, my own speculation, but in the human breeding that we've done over centuries now, we breed for lots of things. Vision is not one of them, right? Vision is not something any breeder ever thinks about. I'm gonna breed for horses that have really good vision. So I would guess that the longer we continue breeding programs that are human oriented, vision could fall to the wayside even more. Um, and there could be certain breeds that that has happened more in than others. Again, this is all speculation, but it seems logical to me. Um, so when they do studies with a wide variety of horses, there are lots of factors there that they may not be controlling for simply because we don't even think about, uh, about that fact. And this is, I guess, a good point to say that one of the things that they don't know about horses and that we don't have a good way to determine is a horse's, we can test ours. We, each, we all know what kind of vision we have. What is our visual acuity? And we, wear, we get glasses or contact lenses to correct that. So it's not really, so in humans, selective uh, survival of the fittest doesn't even have to do with eyesight anymore either because we just correct eyesight in humans, but we don't, we can't correct eyesight in horses. And actually we can't even test acuity in, in horses. We can test, um, is there vision or no vision? So we can tell if a horse scientists and, and vets have tests to tell if there's no vision in an eye. So if a horse is blind, but it, all they're really telling you is the horse has vision or the horse doesn't have vision. Nothing about how the quality of that vision or what their acuity is. And we have no way to know if one eye has the same acuity as another eye. There's a lot of injuries, diseases, things like that. And one of the things that has always consistently surprised vets is that sometimes there's pretty, um, uh, there can be pretty significant disease in an eye, but the horse will still test as having vision in that eye. But again, we don't know what the quality of the vision out of that eye is. We only know that there is vision of some sort, of some level in that eye. And that's because the eye reacts in certain ways to visual stimuli. Um, all right, a couple more things. I'm, now I'm covering a lot of stuff here. So let's go back to monocular and binocular vision. Horses uh, have the ability for both types of vision and they can move quite easily between these two types of vision, but only if they have free range of movement of their head, okay? Because the monocular vision is anywhere that, you know, so the eyes wide set, anywhere that they can see out of this right eye, that's monocular vision. Anywhere they can see out of the left eye is monocular vision. So the binocular vision is only forward where the two eyes come together in that triangle. Um, so a head, several, at least several feet, maybe even a body length ahead of the horse. 
where those two eyes come together and they have binocular vision. At that point, they can see very similar to us. That's probably again, where they have that 2030 vision if their eyes are good. Um, and they have good depth perception. This is really important. Wherever they have monocular vision, it's not that they have no depth perception, but their depth per perception is much more limited and much less accurate than it is when they're using their binocular vision. So if a horse, you know, really wants to tell, so that's why when, you know, a horse hears something or something scary, one, they want to turn and face it. And two, they want to lift up their, their head. They want to try to put that in their binocular field of vision. So if we do not let a horse turn its head to look at something it's worried about, we are basically not allowing that horse to have better visual acuity for that object or thing. And we're also not letting them um, use their ability to have good depth perception. So they may, they may not know, um, they may not feel safe because they may not know how far away that object or that thing is unless we let them turn, stop and turn their head and look at it, All right? So that's really important. Um, let me see. So horses have, okay. So how much better is their depth perception when they're using binocular vision versus monocular? Five times better. So their depth perception is five times better when they are using their binocular vision versus their monocular vision. The other place where it's a little bit better, not as good as when they're doing binocular, but if you've looked at your horse's eyes closely, we have a round pupil, they have a horizontal pupil. And that horizontal pupil is designed, um, here's another interesting thing, when a horse lowers its head, and this is true of a lot of uh, grazing animals, the eye rotates. Yeah, mommy. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I love it. My color is this. Yeah, you want to hear much? Yeah. What's that? Hello there, how are you? Say hi. Mm -mm. I'm just watching. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, I love. He's now using his binocular vision. I'm looking at him. I love it. So um, again, the pupil that is long inside the eye, and that the eye rotates to keep that pupil horizontal uh, with the horizon. Really, is what that's meant to do. So horses can scan, and their their greatest depth perception and acuity that they have out of the monocular part of their eye or the, the monocular area of vision is out of that, uh, the horizontal strip. And they'll try to keep that parallel to the horizon. Again, that way you can see things that are moving on the horizon at a very far distance. So they do have some, some depth perception that's a little bit better in that, that visual strip, uh, but it's not as good as the depth perception in their binocular vision and um, their depth per perception is even much less in the other areas of the eye that isn't in that strip, okay? So with horses, it's not that they have, their vision is not equal at all times and in all areas. It's it varies quite a bit. Uh, let's see, uh, they can see horses, I mean, <laughs> horses can see objects uh, at a long distance in any direction, but again, they can't necessarily judge how far away the object is but they can see motion way better than we can at a distance. So I found several things, citations that like horses can see a bird fluttering in a tree across a canyon. That's way, way better vision than we have in terms of movement and motion. So they are, they are, bringing, they, they are taking in all kinds of visual stimuli way, way, way further away from us than we're even we're not even focusing or paying attention to, and they're seeing quite a lot of detail in terms of motion. Uh, and some studies have indicated several that horses can distinguish patterns from at least 100 yards away, which is a football field away. But interestingly, they're able to distinguish patterns that are in motion better than they can distinguish patterns that are not in motion. So again, their eyes evolved to be very, very sensitive to motion because that's what keeps them alive. Could be a predator, could be something um, dangerous in the environment. Something that's stationary is not as concerning to them, but you know how uh, tigers, leopards, cats, big cats, they will be very still, right? For a long time. And then they'll make just a very slight movement. That's how they gain an advantage. So the horse evolved to be able to catch that really slight motion or that change in a pattern 
when that animal um, does move. So this is what, again, this is their superpower. And there's not really anything we do in the domestic world where that's a good superpower, right? We usually consider that they're, if they're really sensitive to motion and to things they're seeing a long distance away, um, we don't really find that helpful to the work that we like to do with horses. All right, so I'm gonna switch gears now to light and dark. Some of you have probably heard things. I know I've, many people are aware that sometimes horses getting on a trailer, one of the factors might be that it's dark inside the, the trailer and it's light on the outside. Sometimes horses will be much happier getting on a trailer that has large windows or a stock type trailer where light is coming in. And this is because um, horses do see well in both light and dark, but so there's cones in the eye are what determine color perception and the things that affect light um, and being able to see particularly being able to see well in low light is how many, um, how many rods that you have, they have in their eyes and horses have uh, a lot more rods than humans do and they have a high proportion of rods to cones, but we also have a high proportion of rods to cones. Actually, the proportion is similar, uh, both 20 to one in humans and horses, but in horses, the cones are not distributed evenly throughout the eye. Once again, this kind of goes back to which parts of the eye they use for what. The cones are tightly packed around the retina. Um, so again, in that visual strip, they have um, more cones. And um, uh, yeah, the, the retina and the visual streak, which are kind of the same area in, in the eye. And what this means is that they have, um, they are better at seeing in low light through the parts of the eye that they also have greater acuity in. Again, this goes back to evolving to be able to see really well predators that might be coming at night, right? That's, again, the eye is made specifically for that purpose. Um, so the, uh, the rods that are distributed um, more evenly make that around the rest of the eye make the entire eye um, more sensitive to low levels of light than ours are. What that means is that horses see better in low light than we do, all right? But one of the things that all the studies confirm is that um, horses do not adjust to changes from light to dark or dark to light as quickly as we do. The way that their rods are um, and that they have fewer rods than we do, or no, they have more rods than we do, sorry. They have more rods than we do, but the way that those adjust. So when we walk in from a sunny day outside and we walk into that dark uh, uh, barn aisle way, our eyes adjust pretty quickly. The horse's eyes will adjust and once they adjust they will actually see better than we do in that low light situation but it takes significantly longer for them to adjust to that light than we do so when they first walk in things that might seem silly that they're being nervous that they're nervous about again we're also getting to where maybe things are closer in where their vision isn't their acuity isn't as good so we've got a combination of things happening here might be blurry they also can't see it as well because their eyes haven't adjusted so really helpful if we can give them plenty of time to, for their eyes to adjust. And when a horse is going in and out of a trailer, right, maybe it just gets its head in. Um, if it's in there for a while, its eyes may adjust to that, but then as soon as it steps back out and goes back in the bright sunlight. So the horse's eyes are trying to adjust to both of these things and we may not be giving them time visually for their eyes to adjust to each setting before we're asking them for something to make another transition. So these are just things I think could be really helpful to understand what might be happening for your horse if they are struggling. And then again, we go back to how good is that particular horse's vision, even within the larger scope of what we know about, about equine vision. Um, so that could have effect on why they don't wanna get into trailers or why they're hesitant to, why they can be a little spooky in barn aisles, um, also why they may be nervous initially if they're entering into a covered arena from a bright sunny day. Um, and again, once their eyes adjust, they see even better than we do, but it takes them a while to adjust. And horses, horses' eyes are happiest in lower light situations. So a cloudy day or in the shade than they are in the bright direct sunlight. And their eyes are very sensitive to that sunlight, but they do have some really cool features that help them cope with that. 
One of them is only works really well if their head is down grazing as they would be in the wild most of the day. If, you're, if your head is down grazing, then you're gonna have more protection from the eyelids and the eyelashes, right? When they're in direct sunlight, that pupil will narrow down to just a slit. So they can close out a lot of that light to protect themselves. But again, the eyelid and the eyelashes are gonna provide a more protection if their head is down. And they also have something built into the eye I'm gonna see if I can find it here. Um, yeah, it's a special tissue. And if you ever look at your horse in direct sunlight, you'll see the big, the pupil, the horizontal pupil. And then you may see what looks like little fingers of a bluish color almost coming down into the pupil. This is called the corpora nigrans. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right. C-O-R-P-O-R-A-N-I-G-R-A-N-S. Capora nigrans, and you can look it up, but it hangs down like an awning or a visor over the pupil and protects the pupil from that direct sunlight. Pretty cool. Um, so they, they can, um, they have ways to cope with the direct sunlight, but if a horse is often with its head up in direct sunlight, that could, who knows, if that could have an effect on how, how quickly their vision deteriorates or if there's damage to the eye based on that. I don't, I don't know that anyone has really studied all of that. But if you think about it, they evolved to have that head down lower, not so much getting the direct, direct sunlight. Um, so at night, the horse's pupil can go, can dilate to almost, almost circular. So it goes from really just like a slit during broad daylight and or sunlight, and then it can contract into like almost a, a round shape at night. And they have something, um, if you ever notice, just like with like cats or some other animals, if you flash a flashlight or headlights on horses at night, their eyes will you'll get that reflection. We don't have that. That is uh, called a tapetum, a reflective tapetum. It's behind the retina and it's designed for animals that need to have good uh, vision at night and, or in low light. It gives the receptors in their eyes a second chance to capture light. So that is one of the features that allows them to see so much better than us in, in low light. So it's really, their eyes are really pretty amazing. Um, the last thing I wanna address before we open it up to more of a, a discussion and conversation is that I, I also used to hear a lot about, we've all experienced it, horse go by. They, they're nervous about something going by in this direction, we work through it, but then when they turn around and they come past that same object in the other direction, they'll act like they've never seen it before. So there was a lot of, I had always heard that maybe they, they couldn't process information coming in from the right eye to transfer that information and, and recognize the thing with the left eye. There lots of studies have proven that that's not true. Horses transfer information from one hemisphere of the brain to another, just like we do. So what that's probably more likely about, if you think about it, most things look a little different coming from a different angle. Like we, we, the way our brain works, we say, oh, that's a trash can. Then the next time it's a trash can again. They don't have that label to put on things. So they're just saying, what does it look like as I'm passing by it this way? Well, when you turn around and you come the other way, one, it may have a little different shape. You may be approaching it from a little bit different angle, maybe closer or farther away. Maybe the light's reflecting on it differently. Maybe there's a shadow, you know, Heck, maybe they're looking at something way over there that's moving that we think they're looking at this, right? We're so single-minded about that thing. Then there's also the possibility that they're feeding off of nervousness in us or those kinds of things. But just visually, um, it's probably much more likely that that object just looks different um, coming from the different direction or a different way. Or if they're passing the same object twice and we're like, gosh, you've passed that five times. Why are you spooking about that now? Again, maybe there's a different shadow on it. Maybe it was direct sunlight the first time and now it's shady you know, or cloudy. Who knows? Just we need to understand that those things affect the way they see objects very differently than the way we see objects. Um, so it's just really, really important to remember they're not seeing everything the same way that we are. Whew, okay, I, I just spewed out a lot of information. Um, so I'd love to, I'm just gonna unmute you guys now. And, and I'd love to just hear if there's anything about this that was um, surprising to you, if it was new information, anything that struck you as like, wow, that really, um, that really struck me based on experiences you've had with your horse um, or if it will change the way that you approach certain things. Um, 
So I'll let, just let you guys, uh, if you want to speak first, uh, just raise your hand. If you have a, a comment you want to make. Okay. <laughs> All right, Anne. Um, so what I found interesting is I'm working on a course for myself and talking, one of my topics is vision for writers and how, you know, they can better use their vision yeah. um, to help them and to communicate with the horse. Cause um, you know, what a lot of writers get stuck doing is they're sort of concentrating on that, you know, like four foot space, maybe two foot space between their saddle and the front of the horse and, <laughs> and down, not looking where they're going. And so if the horse, if their vision is much worse below their eye level and you as a rider are always focused basically below their eye level or right behind their eye level, you know, they're, they're just wondering like, what are you focused on? <laughs> but I mean, what are you looking at? You know, and, and I've always sort of known that, but now it just, it makes more sense, you know, why the horses are like, you know, I mean, if you look up and around and where you want to go, the horse is usually more than willing to go with you. Mm -hmm. But so many people, you know, especially, you know, people that ride for competition or, you know, they just get focused on that spot in front of them and that's it. Yeah. And then they wonder, you know, why the horse wonders about what's happening outside of that spot. Absolutely. Yeah. They're and not acknowledging it. Yeah. And it doesn't feel, I mean, horses are very attuned to, to synchrony and being in sync. And so if we're looking where we want to be going and, and, and again, another thing about that, depending on, you know, how someone's riding, but you know, if they're in a collective position and their head is in this certain position, they're going to see mostly that binocular vision is going to be kind of like the dirt right in front of right. them. Right. And they have a big blind spot where that forehead is. So that's another reason why, gosh, one of you better be looking where you're going. Right. Exactly. <laughs> because, you, know, you, right. Had, you hear about situations where horses actually like run into each other yes, head, sure. head on. and now you can understand why if we're right. putting their head in a position where they can't see right in front of them, well, we better, we better do that, that kind of vision for them and that right. kind of hearing for them. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good, very good, um, and very cool too with how they um, see movement patterns better at you know at a distance. I I thought that was very interesting. I mean, I grew up jumping horses, so that kind of you know that makes that also makes sense because you know a lot of times you can tell they can see a jump from a distance, maybe with a pattern on it, they see better than something that's natural, but you know, certainly if it's moving, if it's something's blowing, they see that much quicker and, you know, they're much more interested in that than just a still pattern. So that's interesting. That is really interesting. And, you know, just jumping in general, I would guess that a horse with better visual acuity would yeah. probably be a lot more confident jumping and uh, why some horses are really reliant on the rider to tell them like, when is the right place to take off right or have trouble right. judging distances it's not only riders that have trouble judging distances but probably some horses have a, it's more challenging to them sure um, and then yeah. yeah and I think then you have the ones that are very you know they want to take control because they're probably not confident that the rider is going to do you know so you have both ends but yeah Absolutely. Yeah. Just like us, we all have different types of personality, exactly. special situations, like either I want to be in control or I want to follow. Right. right. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. But those are great, great comments, Anna. Sandy. Yes. I want to piggyback on what Anna said, because I just did a three day uh, clinic with Jennifer Bauer with gated horsemanship and what I loved about what she said, and she stayed at my house, so we talked about a lot of things even beyond the clinic, and she said, Sandy, when you're riding Camilla, always keep her nose pointed one way or another, just slightly. Hmm. And I didn't ask her why, right? But now, I mean, this is so great, because I'm like, all right, she knew that she could see better, and it's funny, I don't know if you guys have this, but I seem to have at least one animal in my life that shows up just the way I am in the world to teach me how to look at myself at a deeper level. Oh yeah. And this, this is that. And she likes to see where she's going. 
And I'm like, oh, I like to see where I'm going, which is why I live on the top of a hill and I don't have a lot of trees around me because being able to see really far is important to me. Yes. <laughs> so I love that correlation. And then where was this when I was trying to get Camilla loaded in the trail? <laughs> because now I'm just like, all right, you know, I understand more of what's, what was happening for her and why even when we did make progress, she'd get her front feet in first and wait. And now I see that she was probably adjusting to the light and it's sunny day. So Colorado super sunny. So dark trailer, super bright. And then also, um, letting what I found actually with some success is letting her really be able to move around. Mm. And I think, you know, when I listened to you talk about this, it was important for her to see what else was in there, what else was around her. Sure. So um, three kind of connections in terms of, of my particular horse, because I'm really working on her feeling like I'm a safe place and that she can have confidence in me. So my understanding her better and how they operate and how they see and what's important helps me be able to put her in a position where she can actually have more trust as well than just blind trust. Yes. I have a hard time doing myself <laughs> with anybody. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. I love how you're relating this Great to metaphors. <laughs> she's like you. Yeah. You know, as you were talking, I was even in, so envisioning Camilla, envisioning at other times when my horses have been part way on like the front feet are on and their eye like they're taking that time trying to adjust the other thing is again they don't have good vision underneath their are actually so where, what we're asking their hind feet to step up onto then they probably can't see at all and then if that part of the trailer is in sunlight their eyes are adjusting to being dark on the inside and yet they're trying to and they may not have good acuity and focus in that area of you know, that's a vulnerable thing to where am I putting my hind feet on? I want to make sure I know what I'm stepping on and into. Um, so it's not just about the front end adjusting, but their hind end is still in the, in the broad daylight, chances are. And there could be a lot of, so we're asking that eye to be able to figure out several things at the same time. Um, yeah, that's a lot. When you really think about it, it's kind of like amazing they, they ever do it at all. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Karen. Sandy's right on. Um, Gulliver and I, uh, I have monocular vision. Ooh. And so, um, and Gulliver and I both have a high startle response. And, you know, I know some of that is, is trauma related from, for both of us in, in, in our separate pasts. But, um, wow. Powerful. I'm learning, I'm learning so much. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about how do, how do you have monocular vision? Do you mind me asking? Um, when I see distance and when I see close. Oh, wow. And, uh, and it had a, a profound effect on my childhood and, you know, because I didn't know this and I ended up going to a vision therapist. Wow. Um, in my, well, I guess my late twenties. Um, and so uh, I thought this was, you know, like, oh, we both need to fix this. You know, I, the horse needs to fix it. I need to fix it. It's like, no, this is, this is a gift. Yes. You see, you know, the world so we can, under, so we can understand each other. Yes. And you both yeah. get to see the world differently than everyone else does, which, is, <laughs> you know, gives you, I like to think of that as superpowers rather than as limitations. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, really cool. It's also interesting what you just said that you had um, different vision in your two eyes. And I know, I know other people who've said that too. Like we can't, of course, it's probably logical that there are horses who also farsighted in one eye, nearsighted in the other, or, you know, different things like that. So again, back to that, like they react differently out of one eye than the other eye. Who's to say we should assume that they have the same vision in both eyes? Um, there's and also when he, you know, when he sees something, you know, he'll, of course he, he hears and sees before I do. Yes. But I am also very attuned to always scanning the distance, always noticing what's going on. Um, and I think that that lends to the startle response for both of us. You know, it's so quick, like what's up, 
what's going on, you know? Yeah, but that's being present in your environment. I joke yeah. a lot. So I do equine assisted learning as well. And we do a lot of just observation of the horses uh, at, at pasture. And um, one of the things that I notice both during the sessions and just all the time when I'm outside, whenever I see one of my horses pop its head up to look, one thing I notice is like horses get, they really focus hard on making sure that they recognize everything that's normal in an environment. So while when I get a new horse for a little while, it goes crazy about the neighbors on their four wheelers. After a few weeks, they don't mm. even pick up their heads about that anymore, right? Because it's the sight, the sight and the sound is normal. They only pick up their head when something is unusual in my neighborhood. And I have learned to value this as like, they're better than watchdogs because they don't bark and tell everybody they notice it, right? I can be outside with my horses hanging out and one picks up its head and looks. And the other thing I've noticed is what they are seeing is always much further away than what I, like a lot of times it, it takes me a while to even figure out what was that little motion they saw of that, that t-shirt on that clothesline, six houses down, you know, that's what they were noticing that isn't usually there, right? And, um, and they'll wanna stop and, and look at it until they can figure it out. So that's another thing about why are they standing and looking at that for so long, again, if it's something that moves, but then gets still, and then maybe doesn't move again until the wind blows or some other reason, they want to stay looking at it until it moves again, because that's mm -hmm. what they, they have better acuity. They have, they, they can identify that thing better when it's moving than when it's still. So we have all kinds of reasons about, we just get impatient with it, but that's what they're wired to do, to make sure they understand what that thing that moved way out there is before they can get on with their lives and feel and feel safe. If we don't let them figure that out, they're going to remain concerned or anxious about that thing that is unresolved to them in their mind. But um, but I love now like thinking of my horses as like the watchdogs of the neighborhood, and um, I can notice things that nobody else would ever pay attention to because my horse noticed it, and I can I can pay attention to. Pretty cool. Yes, Sandy. Um. So. Uh, Kim knows this. I've been working with a woman named Dr. Susan Fay. She wrote a book called Sacred Spaces, and it's about science. And um, it's she says, communion with the horse through science and spirit. And so we've been working together with my horses. And it's interesting because one of the things she's been having me do is tell my horses stories, mm -hmm. right? So there's an emotion that goes with that physiology. And so it's really interesting, Kim, because recently when I have been walking with her, leading her or riding her, and she's a noticer, like she, I love that she notices, but I'm kind of like you, Karen, I can have that sort of, uh, should I be worried about this, right? Like mm -hmm. that my initial response is not, oh, this is great. It's, should I be worried? Because <laughs> I'm overcoming some trauma stuff, you know, from coming off. But lately, she notices and I notice and I start and then I see what she's seeing most of the time. And then I start telling her a story about it. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, let's go look at that. Oh, come with me. Let's look at that closer. Oh, that's nothing to be afraid of. Oh, that's a, like, so I'm talking to myself and my horse the whole time, but I'm noticing this relaxation that's happening. And so I love that you're putting this puzzle piece in here for me, Kim, around the sight piece and how that's helpful, yes. how that's a gift, how that's something to look forward to versus something I need to be worried about and then trans therefore transfer that worry to her. And so I've yes. already been making that shift without kind of knowing this science around the physiology. So this is really helpful to think about, you know, the gift that she has to let me know, like you said, Karen, she hears, she sees, she experiences stuff before I do and how I can come in and um, make sure I shift that to a good place for both of us. Mm -hmm. You know, now if it was a bear or a mountain lion, I might be like, thank you for seeing that. Let's get the heck out of here. <laughs> <You know? Heck> yeah. <laughs> That's not a plastic bag or a trash can. That's a lot. <laughs> well, um, what you're, I'm, I'm going to go into something that's a little off topic for vision, but I think it is very related, especially to what you just said, Sandy. Um, so, one of the things I, I teach a course on is about fear and anxiety and core beliefs and that kind of thing. But what we talk a lot about around fear is that 
when we have a fear reaction and the fear reaction is same, whether a fear is real or perceived, right? The physiological response is the same. The way to move uh, through that fear is to investigate and find out if that fear is true or valid. And that's what the horse is trying to do by taking that time. And like you said, if we get nervous when our horse kind of goes, oh, if we can then join them in that process of investigation until we're both sure that, oh, it's all okay, like allow ourselves that, right? Because if we, if we pressure ourselves to continue on before either or both of us, both of us, sometimes the horse may resolve it before we do. We're still on adrenaline about that situation, like still worried about it. If we can take the time until we both are like, we're good, then we move on. That is practicing dealing with fear in a healthy way in the other areas of our life. So fear becomes anxiety when we are, when the fear is unresolved, right? When we've, we're not sure whether it's real or it's not, or um, how serious it is, or we just haven't worked through it, then it becomes anxiety that stays with us because that fear is unresolved. So I love that. And what a great shift that would be with riders and think how much safer probably riding would be if we built that into the process, not get your horse's attention on you, make the horse do that, but instead honored the fact that we all have to investigate our fears and the horse has different uh, stress reactions and responds different to different stimuli than we do. It's not fair for us to you know, assume that they can handle it or see it or perceive it the same way that we do. Or we push them through it and now we push them over a threshold because of dominance and then we wonder why we get hurt, you know? Right. <laughs> it's so helpful to understand who they are and how they operate to know how to partner differently for success for both of us. And when I say success, I mean relationship, a great experience, something that's really good for both of us. And so, so helpful. This is so helpful. Thank you. Well, I think it would be interesting to you in thinking about that. Like if we knew, do they, like when they're looking at something, can they in some way, you know, maybe not consciously, but some way, are they controlling those different rods and cones? Like by blinking or by moving their eyes around, you know, are they able to sort of like, you know, it makes me think of like one of those kid cameras, you know, with the different pictures in it when you click it, but it's like, if they go click, 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 like, are they changing their vision and trying to interpret what they're seeing? And when we're not acknowledging that and giving them a chance to do that, you know, then we are harming the relationship, but we're also getting in the way of a physiological thing. Like, you know, I think, you know, what I was kind of taught, I think what a lot of people are taught is like, the horse is just staring at it, you know, yeah, trying to figure it out, but there's like, you're not taught that maybe they're processing or maybe <laughs> their, their eyes are adjusting. Maybe they have this like really super cool eye. That's like super spy eye. And they're like, you know, click, 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 trying to figure out what that is. And here you are like getting angry and, you know, move on. Yeah. And it's like, you could just give them, you know, maybe it only takes them five, 10, 30 seconds to go through all those visions. And then they're like, oh, got it. Okay, fine. Right. You know? So you could take 30 seconds and see what was happening or, you know, push them on. And then, you know, now you've got five years of baggage to undo because you wouldn't take 30 seconds exactly and yeah and it is usually not that long right, right. That they, but yes i think they are um probably adjusting their eyes to what they're seeing but also i know my my older gilding used to do this he and he even did it when he was younger so i'm now thinking that maybe his vision he had some uniqueness about his vision but he would bob his head <laughs> like this right well, if, that, if they have that horizontal strip, right, he's probably trying, and maybe if he had better in one eye, I don't know what his issue was, but clearly that was helpful to him in judging maybe the depth perception or the detail of it. So they have to work to get that, what they're looking at in that part of their eye. And maybe they wanna see it up that way. And then maybe they wanna see it, like you said, with a little bit different part of their eye. Like, you know, when we're investigating, we don't know because we don't have all those different parts of our eye to know and maybe every individual again uh you know and it was interesting about the you know eye level too because 
my my older horse he's always been this way and we we used to call it you know periscope up because as soon as he sees something he's not sure about his head kind of comes up and is like his neck comes up and his head comes in and it's always you know you a lot of horses will kind of extend their neck out and they you know they try to kind of put their nose on it no he's always like up and like you know so something about his vision yes not every horse I have does that it you know so correct and it seems like such an epiphany to us to go oh every horse's vision is different but every member right. of my family every member of my family right. has different vision you know geez right. I, I'm helpless without my glasses right it's like really sad right uh, it's gonna take me a long time to try to read that menu or figure something out and if the light's not right I can't so again that's another reason why we wouldn't um necessarily ride or train every horse the same you know Kim you were the one who um introduced me to Lucy Reese's work yes and she has this video of a herd of horses and one horse picks something up and the rest kind of follows and then it transfers to this other side of the herd so there's transference of this what are you seeing what are you seeing what are you seeing what are you seeing and I think sometimes my horse is looking for me to help them with what we're seeing. Like I'm realizing this little light bulb going off to say, I don't want to be like the herd that just goes, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Oh, you know, like, and I do that, right? I go, she goes, oh my gosh. And I go, oh my gosh. And then she goes, oh my gosh. And I go, oh my gosh. <laughs> now we're like all freaking out where this helps me think about, oh, I can be the one to like create this stable moment if I will slow down, pay attention, give her reassurance, give myself reassurance, you know, lots of tools to do that. But that image when you were talking, Anna came into my head about the reactionary nature of a herd that's, that are prey animals and I'm not. So what gift can I bring in that experience? You Ooh. know. That is beautiful, Sandy. Yes. And, you know, so what I noticed in, so that's a, you were talking about what you saw in that wild herd. And what I see often in my domestic herd is one notices something lift up, lift up, lifts up its head. And there's clearly, and sometimes I can't see it. So it's something energetic. So that horse then either, it, that horse investigates it and either decides it's all okay, or does something to its body or through its energy that tells the others to look. So sometimes one looks and all the others don't even pick up their head, right? Cause they're like, he's checking it out. And that horse obviously hasn't set the alarm and other times one will look and then two or two others will look, right? And it's like, why something about how that first horse responded caused them to say, we need to look too. Um, so when that's another thing, one is we can help the horse calm, but the other is like, what if our horse is giving that higher alarm that says, pay attention, pay attention. And we're saying, don't pay attention. Again, we're not helping that horse feel the, the backup that it has in its herd where the others can lend themselves either to help calming or to help investigating either one. That, yeah, we forget they're herd animals, right? We, they're, they're wired to respond in ways that communicates energy and information to the rest of the herd. Beautiful, I love that, Sandy. Thank you. I find that I need to, what I've been working on is increasing my capacity to hold that space to, you know, when he starts to go up and I start to go up, I also come down faster, mm. you know, so that I can help him re-regulate. Re yes. You know, yes. but it's, it's also, you know, you're talking about the one horse, um, and the, all of a sudden the rest of the herd getting, getting, becoming aware of what's going on. But I think sometimes we, you know, the, our horses may just look at something and like you were saying, Sandy, we go, uh oh, what is it? You know, so I also want to make sure that I come at it more with curiosity rather than, uh oh, what happened? Yes. Yeah. That's a beautiful, that's a beautiful comment right there too, is like, even when mine see something and look up, there may be a different energy of I'm looking up out of curiosity at something new versus I'm looking up at a, out of fear. 
at something new. Both are both are perfectly legitimate uh, responses. Horses are crea curious, creative, inquisitive beings. You know, seeing something interesting, new, and interesting, and especially in their domestic life. My horses live in the same pasture, you know, all the time. All, all it's not all that interesting. So maybe it's really nice to see something and just take a moment to investigate something new and different. Um, but yeah, oh, this is really good conversation. I know. Now I want to go sit out in the pasture and just watch. <laughs> it's going to take me so much longer to walk down the barn aisle watching each horse. <laughs> yes, and you know, it really made me think about. I don't have a barn, but. Um, for those of you that do, really interesting to just like, so we'll think about how different the environment inside a barn is from outside. One, if they're in a stall, they really can't see far away. Everything's pretty close. So are they seeing anything with high acuity really, you know, in that situation? There's different light. They have a window to the outside. That's bright when they stick their head out that or look out that and then they come back in and it's dark again. Um, just lots of things about that invite their heads up probably more often than it is down. Uh, so again, all of these things uh, affect their vision probably over time. It and you know, of, oh, I'm sorry. It puts a lot of perspective in my horse is standing out in the middle of a hailstorm when they yes, could go in yes. a box, right? So it's probably sight and sound. Like we look at it as go in there, that's safe. And they look at it in there going that noise and that light, that's not safe. <laughs> yes. So I leave the doors open. Now you can go in or not. But I've just, it's amazing how they just come out and will stand in anything. And I'm like, are yeah. you doing? But you know, it puts context to that. Yeah, it makes sense that they would want in a storm, want to keep their eyes on everything that's, that's moving and happening and identify what sounds are. Um, yeah. And in the beginning, I was way too protective with that. I would see this huge hailstorm coming, Colorado hailstorms. Bring him in and he would freak. He just wanted to be safe with the herd with all of this noise on a tin roof. Yeah. Yeah, my favorite is, so I live in Charleston, South Carolina where we get you know a lot of hurricanes. And again, I don't have a barn, but I have the run-in shelters. And um, the last couple of low level hurricane, still hurricane though, right? Uh, category one hurricane. Um, I have one horse that lived most of his life in barns and he does tend to go under the run in uh, more than the others do in a storm. But this particular hurricane and I'm in my house like by myself kind of freaking out. The branches are rubbing on the house and the wind is whipping and I'm hearing it and I'm getting anxious. And I look out and all of the horses standing in the center of the pasture with their with their butts to the wind and it's just they're like it's just weather it's serious weather but it's just weather right and and i they're very relaxed out there where they could see and watch everything and they they in instinctively picked an area where they weren't under trees or anything else which in a hurricane is not really the safest place to be so it's really fascinating how um, they know what to do to feel safe in themselves <laughs> it reminds me of uh, we used to joke about that with uh one of Angela's horses when he was able to be turned out all the time, like he would do that. And then they had a really bad storm and the run-in shed got moved. And it was like the horses weren't in the run-in shed. And, you know, you're always like, why won't they go in there? Well, really bad windstorm and run-in shed got relocated. It's like, well, it's a good thing they weren't in there. So, right you no. Know. Yeah, we got to give them credit. They they evolved over millions of years to know how to cope with their world, right? And we think we can go in and tell them that they should cope the same way that we do. Um, right. Yeah. That's the human way, though. Mm hmm Yeah. So um, I guess what would you say is, and I mean, we can continue any other uh things that come to mind about this, but, and some of you have already touched on this, but I guess like just reflecting on what what will you do differently or or change or shift what shifts for you you think most going forward with um interacting and working with your horse or horses hey kim i wanted to make other one other comment about the site piece yeah uh, so i have rocky a rocky mountain and a kentucky mountain and my rocky is flaxen mane and tail not white and I know that my vet, when uh, he came out, it's been a vet for a long time, um, 
and lots and lots and lots of horses. And then there's research being done or having been done about this as well around the lighter, the mane and tail or the lighter, even the coat coloring, sometimes the more issues with horses losing their sight more quickly. Mm. So that's one of the things um, that he checks every time he comes out is to look at that because you know, my Rocky, especially since she's lighter mane and tail, even though she's chocolate body, have more of a tendency towards blindness or, or it's not, it's called something else. It's, it's an actual condition of the eye that kind of mimics blindness, I guess. And so I thought that was interesting too, that had I not known that mm -hmm. and my horse started behaving differently, you know, I might've thought it was something else. And so you know, just to look at that in terms of breeds. Yes, like, I'm glad you brought that up. And you know, that could have again to do with we breed for color, we we breed for certain things. I mean, we know we know with gray horses, or something about the way we've bred for that color creates a tendency toward melasitoma tumors and things like that. So certainly, it does. It doesn't seem implausible that breeding for certain colors could also have the the eye vision vision quality could have gone down um, if. Yeah, and I was kind of bummed because she gets darker and darker every year because she's not white. And then he told me that. I'm like, oh, that's good. <laughs> Be white. <laughs> right? <laughs> Bad thing's now a good thing. <laughs> well, something else that you reminded me of that I wanted to mention, because obviously we know, you know, if you've all have ever heard of Endo the Blind, the, the blind Appaloosa who does so many amazing things. And I have one horse who had um, uh, a fungal infection uh, in her left eye when she was young and ended up having to have we saved the eye went through a long process to save the eye I, she has she does have vision in the eye but we know it's only in two very particular parts the big scar over the whole center she really doesn't have much probably no acuity in that eye more of the really peripheral uh, vision but what's interesting is um you know we think about horses are going to be spookier if they can't see but that's not necessarily true the same with why horses wear blinders why we've put blinders on them is, is it's so much, gosh, think about the amount of stimuli, visual stimuli that's coming into them at all times from all around them and way far away. So actually the more limited that is, they may be less reactive. Once they adjust to that situation, it's just less stimuli coming into them. So we tend to think about that as a, in the domestic world and what we do in some ways it might be actually you know, useful to them to not have quite so much visual stimuli. So that's an interesting thought too. I do notice that my horse that has, is mostly blind on one side, she doesn't spook very much by things on that side because she's not seeing it, right? <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I think um, for me, one of the things I'm going to be taking from this is, um, and just a little history on this, I've, I've worked with my horse on him learning the human words for his body parts. Hmm. And so when I um, was working with eyes, I would say to him, you know, I, and he would turn his eye to me and he would let me clean it out. And then I would say other eye and he would turn his head so I could work on his other eye. Hmm. And just the trust that it takes for him to do that you know, I think this has, has taught me, yeah, shoulder, other shoulder, you know, foot, whatever. Um, but eyes, wow. Yes. That's a lot of trust for him to, to give me his eyes. That is a lot of trust. And you just yeah. reminded me of something else I wanted to touch on that I didn't have in my notes. And that's that, so we, obviously, when you're outside, things get blown in your eye, right? We get where our eyes are dry or itchy or blurry because of something that's in it. And, you know, what do we have hands? We can rub our eye. We can clean out our eye. They don't have that. Now, sometimes they'll rub on their leg and try to rub mm -hmm. their eye. But that's another thing for us to understand. And especially if they're being ridden and controlled. The other thing is they could have stuff in their eyes that is limiting their vision or making that vision um, less clear. And it happens to me and all the time, certainly allergies, right? Those will affect our eye pollen in our eyes. They have a much bigger eye that could, that stuff can get caught on and collect on. 
So that's another thing I think for us to just be sensitive about is that they, um, they their, their eyes may not always be clear either. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So I wanted to just um, summarize, and again, we can, uh, if anything else comes up, but these are just some, some takeaways that were key takeaways for me. Um, one is that just understanding generally that freedom of head movement is really essential for a horse to be able to use its visual superpowers, right? If we're not giving them that, we have to acknowledge that we are limiting those, those superpowers. And I love how Anna was like, kind of like, let's teach people to be like, oh, cool, you're using this superpower you have that I don't have. And like, I wanna watch how you do that. Or the other thing they can just help us be is more present. We all talk about practicing presence. If we stop when they're stopping to look and we're paying attention to the environment, that's just gonna bring us out of our own thoughts and into a better state of calm and presence just because we're connecting to the environment or to our bodies in a different way. Um, the other one I mentioned, I mentioned it a second ago, is just that our horses are processing a massive amount of visual information as compared to us. I don't know what that means because I haven't, I can't experience it, uh, but it's just an acknowledgement that they are, um, they are experiencing their world visually very, very differently than we are. And they have a lot more information they're, they're coping with. Um, it was really, really powerful for me when I realized that probably when I'm next to my horse, I'm not in clear, I'm, I'm blurry to my horse. You know, what I love is getting close to the horse and I can see all the details of the eyelashes and their, you know, different things about them. That's not how they're seeing me in that moment, if they're seeing me at all, because part of me may be in their blind spot, but that they're, they're seeing us most clearly in a different direction. And uh, like one of my horses the other day, I was walking with the wheelbarrow and I wasn't doing anything weird. I walked by him all the time, but maybe it was the way the light was or something. And he's watching it perfectly calm. And then suddenly he was like, you know, he jumps, jumps away from it. Like it just turned into a monster. And, but it could have been also that it was moving from one type of vision for him, an area where it was blurry to then it went into clear focus or the light hit it. Diff I don't know what it was, but you know, we tend to be like, why are you reacting like that? I just, I've been standing here the whole time with that wheelbarrow. But again, they're, they're not experiencing something moving toward them coming out of maybe an area of acuity and focus and into an area that's blurrier or, you know, whatever it may be. Um, let's see, we talked about this, but maybe being more conscious of all the different situations when our horse's eyes are probably having to adjust to changes in light. So in the wild, obviously dark to dawn happens gradually sunset happens gradually. Those transitions are very gradual. And horses make a very intentional decision if they're going to go from sunlight to, I'm going to go stand in that shade now. And then they're resting in the shade. They're probably staying there for a while. But a couple of my horses I know can, you know, would spook at a shadow on the ground or a change in the, the texture or the color of the dirt in a certain situation they're just seeing that differently than us. And, and can we really be sensitive and maybe almost even start to notice before we get there? I bet you that's gonna be challenging for my horse visually. And then watching how you're paying attention to how your horse handles it. Um, that's pretty cool. Rather than just getting upset about it is almost being like proactive in terms of practicing understanding what things might be challenging for our horse. Um, the other is just remembering that they don't, they don't see as well. They still say see well, but direct sunlight is challenging. You know, I know for me, I have eyes that are very sensitive to light. They can't put on sunglasses. <laughs> we don't really, we just don't really think, usually think about how the sunlight is affecting them while we're out on a beautiful day, having a, having a ride when it's bright and sunny. Um, and then generally speaking, except for the areas where they have more like the 20-30 vision, again, if their eyes are good. Generally speaking, they see um, things in the range where we're paying attention in less detail than we do. Um, if they're, especially if they're seeing it in their monocular vision and not really trying hard to put that in acuity and depth perception, they're just, um, 
again, seeing the world in less detail. So it makes me wonder how many times something that startles them comes, moves from that area of I'm seeing it in less detail to suddenly I'm seeing it in more detail. That could be, that could be startling too. And then um, again, about just, they, they detect motion at great distances um, more than we do. And I would love to see studies on, you know, do they see differently when they're in motion? I mean, obviously they have the big eyes. The theory is that that's so that they can see well in motion, but I don't know how clearly when they are startled with something, they want to stop and look at it, right? They don't, they're not comfortable looking at it while they're running. So there's something different about being able to stop and be still and look at it. And it may be about being able to control what part of their eye they're, they're using and keeping it steady on something. But um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know that there's been much of any study other than the visual fields about how, how well do they, how well can they use their visual superpowers when they're in motion? You know, if you think about racing, think about not just energetically, but how many adjustments they must make to stay in those tight places with everyone running at a full gallop. I mean, you know, kind of piggybacking on what you said, they must have some pretty good sense about that, you know, absolutely physical, but also maybe visual even too. Yeah, that's how, I was gonna say, how, how good is their vision at three years old then? Ooh, there's another one. And sometimes they're wearing blinders. And yeah, yeah. even if you see well, if you're not the one controlling or steering yourself, how much does it even really, you know, matter? Um, but I think one of the, the point, a really big point, which could be a whole nother interesting seminar to do at some point is, um, you know, we're talking about vision in isolation. None of us use any of our senses in isolation. So like, like, I'm sure that maybe if visual, um, if we do things that limit a horse's visual capabilities, it may be also having a cascading effect on other things that rely on vision as part of the process or that it triggers certain things. So again, we can't think about vision just in isolation, although today we have been talking about it in isolation, but that's a good reminder, Sandy, that it's... My, my horse was boarded for a while on a place with a thousand acres that had a million prairie dog holes. And there was never a horse that hurt itself. Wow. And I was like, how is that possible? Never stepped in a hole. Galloping across the place, never stepping in one of those holes. Well, you know, it, legs. So I'm like, it was incredible. What's interesting about that is I have heard that horses can map out territories like and be really aware of where everything is. But if those horses were out there and were grazing, so their head was down, they could visually probably identify those holes much better than they could if their head were up. And so if they live in that environment, they could become very aware of where they all are. Whereas if you took a horse that hadn't, wasn't familiar with that territory and went to ride it in there, probably would step in some of those holes. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. This has been a great conversation. I am so thankful for you ladies for, for being here. And I think those who get the recording are in for a treat with this, with this discussion. So um, before I wrap it up, is there any final comments any of you want to make or observations? Excellent. Thank you for all your work. Thank you. Oh, it's, you're welcome. It's worth several times more than what you charged us for those listening. <laughs> you better raise your price. I've oh. paid more. <laughs> yeah, I knew I knew it would be valuable, but I really did. It was, you know. I wish even more people would sign up because I think this is really valuable information. So I do encourage you to share what you've learned, talk to your students, encourage them to do research. And um, I'll probably will put this recording up for others who didn't already pre-register to purchase it if they want to, because I think we covered a lot of great ground here and I really appreciate your contributions. It was so, so great um, to meet everybody. Yeah. Um, would love to keep in touch. So I don't know quite how you want to do that, Kim, but. <laughs> yeah, I'll figure out how to connect y'all. Maybe I'll, um, when I send out the, uh, if you guys are all comfortable when I send out the recording, I'll do it via email so you all can have each other's uh, contact information as well, if that's okay. Sure. All right. I am Super. so grateful. Thank you so much. You are so welcome. I'm so grateful for y'all too. So have a wonderful day. Thank you too. Thank you. You too. <laughs> Bye.